Hey everyone, it's Kira here from Toronto. Today, I am honored to welcome Raj Kochibatla, research and insights practitioner, agency owner, educator in the field, and brilliant research solutions orchestrator. Hi Raj, how are you? Good Kira, how are you? Glad to be here. Wonderful. So I see something interesting on your wall. Can <laughs> you tell me to start off, what's your favorite superhero? Oh yeah, it's uh, no surprise as you can see here. Uh, yeah, I've always been a long-term, uh, long-time Batman fan. But interestingly enough, I, I, my rationale behind that is really more about the fact that he is just, uh, you know, his character is the world's greatest detective. Uh, so that that to me is far more appealing in a lot of ways than the gadgets and the cars and all of that stuff. But yeah, always been a huge Batman fan and. And, uh, you know, I'm not shy to display my, 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 my love for Batman here. <laughs> awesome. Detective is actually an interesting angle. Yes. That's why you do research. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. We're, we're <laughs> almost the same, the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So maybe you can tell briefly um, uh, what you do exactly for life, because I think at times research and insights is a very wide Sure. Uh, term. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've been spending the last uh, uh, almost 15 years of my career in the market research space. Um, half of that space has been uh, half of that time has been spent down in the U.S. working for some, uh, small and, 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 and global market research organizations, uh, global market research organizations. Um, and uh, as since I've been here in Toronto, uh, I've worked primarily in the, in the media space, um, but primarily working as a, a research lead. Uh, in the media space, helping clients uh, tell their brand stories through custom insights. Um, I am currently the global head of research for Key Media International, which is a global B2B uh, media organization. And uh, I help work with our advertising and sponsorship clients to enhance their stories and, and get their brand messaging out there um, by uh, conducting custom insights through our various B2B audiences. Um, and I think that there is a uh, a strong desire for organizations uh, within key media and, and outside of key media's verticals uh, that have lots of questions about their customers and need to get, have those questions answered in order to drive their strategy uh, and drive their stories. So um, I'm part of the team that, uh, that, that executes that for them. And um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun for sure. That's great to hear that. That's a lot of fun. And so I think you summarized the topic of today's discussion really well by what you do. And today we're talking about how insights and research can be leveraged better within the marketing process and in general, I think, for business processes, especially mm -hmm. during these times that the budgets are being cut. And we all know that we have to be different, not better, not cheaper. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the brand will die, the product will not be sold. So that's very, very timely and thank you for yeah. that. So let's start from higher level question. Mm -hmm. What would you say the major misconception that doesn't allow CEOs or CMOs to utilize insights and research to its full potential? Well, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that data is insights. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, over the course of my career, I, I've, I've, we've, we've had these terms interchangeable. Um, sure. And I just don't think they are. Um, we have, and especially now, we have an abundance of data uh, through our current marketing and advertising platforms. Um, but it's, it's not just the ability to access this data. It's the ability to interpret it, evaluate it, prioritize it. Um, and, and have a combination of both primary and secondary research sources that will really help yield true insights. Um, I think that if you're not doing these things as a marketer, um, you're not really getting the entire story. And that can be dangerous uh, because you're gonna be making critical decisions um, without really understanding what the, uh, the, the snapshot of your customer's perceptions are, the industry's perceptions are, um, and how it impacts your organization and your brands. Yeah, can you give an example where this misconception leaves? Usually, I bet you see a lot of those examples throughout your work. So what is data that's interpreted as insight and mm -hmm. what's wrong with that? Well, I think that what ends up happening is that when you are looking at clients that are doing just simple brand research, um, if they don't have the right methodologies, if they don't have the right sample sizes, they could be interpreting these findings off of um, 
inaccurate insight or inaccurate oh, that's data. Me. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that, that becomes problematic. So you want to make sure that if you are going to be conducting this work, you need to make sure you have sample sizes that are large enough. You need to make sure the margins of error on whatever research you conduct is as small as possible. Um, I've been in rooms where people are arguing uh, about, you know, key decisions with a very 2% difference between, you know, going one way or going the other but the margin of error on the study is 2.5%. So at the end of the day, you're looking at this going, well, flip a coin, because what, if you're basing your decision on this research alone, um, it's not going to get you a definitive di re, uh, direction one way or another. That's why combining it with other insight uh, opportunities uh, like qualitative research or secondary studies or uh, tapping into any of the other secondary data sets that you have is going to be critical. And many people do this. Um, but I think that you know, if you are new to the game when it comes to leveraging research to drive your strategy, you just gotta be really smart about how you conduct these studies, who's conducting them for you, how to minim minimize as much bias as possible um, to make sure that you're just not um, you know, feeding your own hypotheses with the research. You're actually uncovering you know, unbiased new hypotheses or unbiased new insights to drive this, uh, the strategy moving forward. Yeah, and by the way, is there a rule of thumb on the minimal sample size that is meaningful? Um, not really, only it, because it's dependent on the universe size, right? So if, for example, mm. if you are looking at conducting research amongst consumers, uh, whether in the US or whether here in Canada, you know, you would need a sample size that are in, I would say, the th you know, anywhere north of a thousand or more oh, wow. to, to get a, a really good understanding of what's going on because it's representing, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a universe of, you know, 20 million uh, Canadian adults um, or, or 200 million uh, American adults, right? Uh, so you need to make sure that you have a large enough sample size. However, if you're looking at, you know, trial lawyers, or if you're looking at anesthesiologists, well, then that changes things because the universe size, is, especially here in Canada, is very small uh, in comparison. So you can get away with having a smaller sample size in the research. You know, you can conduct those studies with, you know, 150 or 200 participants and still have statistical significance uh, to make decisions off of. Yeah, so it sounds like you need a practitioner, a specialist to run that research. So what would you say, um, what are our options in different organizations? Do we have to hire third party research who actually can provide that sample as well? Because it sounds like a lot. Or can we do that from in-house in case we have some job titles that kind of do that research? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's really more of a combination of the both, right? Mm. I think that, you know, from my experience, you know, we've worked with lots of clients who have in-house research firms, um, and they have a far more longitudinal perspective on their brand. So they understand mm. their, the brand positioning over the last, you know, several years, let's say, right? That's something that a third-party research firm, unless they've been a partner for that period of time, does not have. So there is help, there is, it is helpful to look at what research has been done internally and then build off of it. Uh, my experience has been, you know, and I'm biased because I've been in the consulting space, I've been in the research space, there is a value that comes to having that third party come in and bring their experiences outside the organization into a project or into a program. I mean, they can leverage uh, methodologies and, and learnings from other organizations, competitive organizations, if you will, at times, um, or even other industries, mm -hmm. uh, into a program, a research program for a given client um, that has a tremendous amount of value. Um, you know, from, from, from everything from survey development to, you know, I, defining the ideal methodologies, you know, leveraging resources that are outside the, the, the scope of any given research, internal research team's uh, uh, ability. Um, but I think more than anything, it, they bring an unbiased approach. And I think mm -hmm. that is the most powerful thing that they bring. They come in without really having any skin in the game. The market research consulting firms are basically in saying, you know, we'll just tell you what is going on. You know, we don't, from our perspective, we don't have um, uh, any rationale to lean in one direction or the other. We just want to tell you what's happening. That may or may not be as um, prevalent when you're dealing with internal research firms. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not to say that they, they, they can't do this. It's just that, you know, it's just the nature of, of, of the industries that, and, and, and nature of these teams that, you know, they are, um, were, you know, most more often than not reporting into the marketing leads and, and, you know, they have a perspective that they want to, um, 
you know, advanced, if you will. Um, that doesn't, that's not the case necessarily when you look, when you're dealing with third party friends, which is always why it's good to bring them on board as at the very least as a check on your um, testing of your existing hypotheses. Yeah, absolutely. As you were speaking, I was thinking validation. So there is someone inside who loves the, the brand, lives and breathes the, the brand. And mm -hmm. then you bring the third party for validation according to whatever your plan is, whatever your budget is. And to that point, who is usually your client? Who orders that, that research? Is it marketing? Is it a special department? Is it mm -hmm. uh, operations? management? What is that? Yeah, I mean, it could be all of the above. I mean, it really mm -hmm. depends on the way that these firms are structured, uh, these clients are structured. More often than not, uh, the procurement team is, uh, of research usually works with marketing. Uh, they're the ones who have uh, the largest budgets, the, the broadest scope uh, of what they want to accomplish. Um, and, but however, we've done projects that are, we're working with the PR team, we're working with the comms team. Mm -hmm. All of these folks have a message they want to put out. Um, and we've seen that they've all been stakeholders in many of these pro programs. Um, when it comes to you know, the types of companies that, that, that conduct research, um, you know, they, they fall within the spectrum of, of, of all these varied stages. You know, startups all the way to you know, Fortune 100, mm -hmm. Fortune 50 companies, right? Um, it, it really comes down to, you know, the uncertainty in the market place, the, you know, anything that's going on envir environmentally within a given customer base, um, how that impacts a brand, you know, if there's a, re a, 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 a new launch uh, of a product, oh, yeah. if there's a new uh, brand strategy that's being pushed out and you want to test against that, um, if you're in a very competitive space and you know, you are a, a mid-sized competitor and you're competing against folks that are way bigger than you are. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to compete dollar for dollar on advertising. You just won't, you know, totally. you'll, get, you'll get outspent. So how do you gain additional exposure? Most of our clients who have fallen into these categories say, you know what, we're not going to compete dollar for dollar. So let's see if we can have spend our, our money wisely and tell a better story. And let's get out there and educate uh, an audience uh, on, on uh, a key issue or, or, or a key challenge that they're facing. And then let us get exposure on being thought leaders. And that thought leadership exposure um, could be far more impactful than uh, the advertising dollars that are spent uh, just to get your name out there, right? Yeah, so basically you are saying if you are a company who has probably smaller budgets or is just trying it out, mm -hmm it might be better to use insights and research to frame your niche, which is the Pareto principle, you know, let's research this specific pain point and target that, but yeah. be very, very proactive and relevant. That's wonderful, I think, because what I see in this COVID time, I believe we have to know our audience really, really well, and it has nothing to do with widely spent advertising dollars. So, I'm coming back to what you said in the beginning. You mentioned data mm -hmm. that feeds insights mm -hmm. and insights feed storytelling. Yes. So have you seen maybe lately or in the recent years how this storytelling, data storytelling is um, becoming more and more popular? Because I do see that in my everyday work. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, because I spent the bulk of my last 10 years in the B2B space, um, you know, we have noticed that, you know, when you're dealing with specific professional groups um, from insurance brokers to financial advisors to lawyers to doctors, you know, these are for sophisticated uh, professionals and mm -hmm. they are, you know, they, they, they thrive on being more knowledgeable, if you will, um, than their competitors. And that's how they yeah. win, right? Especially in the service business where they're trying to acquire clients and trying to retain clients they need to provide value on a daily basis. So how do they do that, mm -hmm. right? They do that by showing that they're able to tell better stories to their clients uh, about what's going on in their industry and how their knowledge and understanding of uh, what's going on is going to make them a better partner. Um, and so what we try to do in a lot of ways is facilitate that story. Um, and how do you do so? Um, there's a couple of ways to do it, but the way that I find most helpful is if you can provide um, stories that are filled with insights from their industries uh, amongst their peers, now all of a sudden you are giving them a, um, 
an, an unbiased, unvarnished perspective on what's really going on. And they can share that uh, with, with the, I think, a higher form of credibility with their clients. And that in itself will endear them uh, with their clients to be value add, to provide value. Um, and we're seeing this across every industry that we touch upon from, like and I said, you know, what, in the beginning of my career, I spent a lot of time in the healthcare space. And mm -hmm. so we would provide research um, across, you know, all of our different um, uh, products to physicians, to health practitioners on how to help their patients be more uh, educated and informed on their treatment protocols. A physician that is able to have those conversations with their, with their patients are going to have a better relationship with those patients. And those patients are going to more, more or less um, uh, adhere to those protocols and potentially have better outcomes, right? Well, yeah, you know what? I'm thinking, especially in the fields that have been commoditized, which is most of the traditional fields like finance, medicine, I guess, how do you differentiate is just by providing the service. And if your service is insightful, as you just said, mm -hmm. it's probably increasing customer loyalty and customer advocacy, right? So people yeah. also advocate for your service. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's great insight. I and love the, this storytelling path. Yeah. And the other thing also is like when you're, when you're talking to clients about, you know, it's not just storytelling to, um, it's not, it's not just the, the stories telling itself that, that, that is valuable. It's the exercise that, from a marketer's perspective, that what this, what, what this insights gathering exercise does to help build data stories is really understand whether your uh, differentiator is a differentiator, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times as marketers, and I've, I've been in the rooms many times, they say, well, our features and benefits are X, Y, and Z. Yeah, um, we think, we know. We, and yeah. you think that those mm -hmm. features are valuable and the benefits are clear. Well, are you sure? Like, do you know if those are the most important things? And if you're going out and pressing that to the, to, to the, to the, uh, the, the marketing landscape, your customer landscape, um, and you're wrong, um, it's a colossal waste of time. Um, and so- And money. And money. And why not spend um, just a little bit of a budget and a little bit of effort to ensure that when, and, and, and do it on a regular basis. Because what ends up happening is, you know, you have organizations that, be, that do this work at a single point in time, and then they, get, they wait years, unfortunately, to do it again. And mm -hmm. a, lot ha a lot can change in that, in that gap, right? So you need to be doing this on a constant basis. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've had clients that have said that they do this quarterly, which is, you know, a lot, but it gives them a fresh perspective on a constant basis to react. And their messages change based on the feedback they're getting from their customers. And they're, they're increasing their relevance. Um, uh, and they're able to react very, very quickly uh, to feedback that they're, that they're getting. So I think that, you know, from my experience, it, it, it's critical to prioritize this. It's, criti it's critical to prioritize insights-based storytelling to help your brand um, and your marketing strategy and your engagement strategy. And, and also understand that it's not just the, the message itself, but what vehicle you're using to push that message out, right? So what we can do when we build these custom studies for our clients is say, okay, well, if you're going to, we can, we can subsect the survey a questionnaire based on how this is impacting your social media strategy, your print strategy, your event strategy, um, wow. mm -hmm. your digital strategy. So the, 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 insight, the points of insight that are coming out of the research can be delivered in such a way that they are geared towards not just the audience, but the vehicle that you're going to be communicating to with that audience. Oh, that's amazing. Because to me, what you're telling me about sounds like, yes, spend time and money on preparing the campaign or the rollout or whatever it is well. Mm -hmm. And then you will be very targeted and probably you will be able to measure the income impact of your work instead of doing something that we think is right and then trying to fix that on the go wasting time money resource and actually irritating our clients yeah and i think that like you know i always equate to the to, to this idea that you cannot use a broad sword you know across mm -hmm. the board for every single uh communication strategy you're pushing out pr strategy you're pushing out um and and you and, and and you you need to be really specific on you know what messages are going through what channels um, and how you can and what and and if you are if you have the ability to do custom research uh, against your audience that is 
purposefully being pushed out for specific channels, I think that's a tremendous way to ensure that you're, you're gonna get the maximum impact from whatever research you do execute. Oh, that's, you know what, it's one of the aha moments that I'm having during these conversations. Mm -hmm. So basically what you are saying, if you know that you are going, or you assume you are going to use PR mm -hmm. or social media mm -hmm. to reach your audience, so you can do research so that the outcome actually fits the medium. So it right. will be like shorter snippets um, or it will be thought leadership articles and those insights that, you know, Globe and Mail will be eager to take on. Right. And the thing is that when it's, 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 it's about the methodology, right? I mean, survey development is, is, um, is critical. And, and you, if you're building a white paper or you're building a, you know, a large government report, yes, you can have a far longer survey that's going to be far more detailed in the way that you're um, more expensive, asking the I guess. questions. It can be more expensive, um, but it's dry it's in a lot of ways, right? And I get True. the fact, and I, and, but, but there is a need for it and there's, it's impactful and you need, to, you need to get into the weeds sometimes and lots of these issues. And that's, you, you do a disservice by trying to do it quickly. Um, however, mm -hmm. if you are looking, and, but most, most brands don't do that, right? Most brands are pushing out messages in their Twitter feeds or their Instagram posts, um, you know, building an infographic, if you will. You know, in order to do all, all of that, um, you need to make sure that your questions are tight that they that you have a strategy in advance of survey development that identifies what the headlines you'd like this research to actually say is because once you know that then you can sit there and formulate your survey questions around those hypotheses and if you if the outcome of the data uh, of, of the of the program uh, supports or refutes the, that hypothesis it's fine you know you're mm -hmm. if, if it refutes what you're thinking I always look at that as a win as a bigger win because that is something that's going to be surprising because I guarantee you that you're not the only person that has that hypothesis. So if you're going to bring something new to the table and really have greater exposure, it's on presenting findings that are surprising and shocking. And I think that that's, that's something that we, we, we look for as gold in the research industry, especially in the content research industry. Yeah, and actually with creative and smart storytelling, you can even use this negative effect uh, to show kind of personalization or humanization of your brand. Here's mm -hmm. what we thought it is, but it's actually not. And I don't ask them. Yeah, and I don't, I don't necessarily look at it as positive or negative. I think that, that, mm. that, I think that you know, if it's, if it's a reality and if it's happening in the industry, yeah. then there, it's not positive or negative. It just is, right? And so it just is. You, yeah. just, you just need to make sure that you're aware of what's going on and you need to make sure you're communicating it. It may be a surprise to, to, to many folks, um, but that, that is, that's fine. I mean, that's a good thing, right? I think that, you know, we, we need to shine a light on, 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 on certain issues and certain challenges that either have been ignored or are, are being looked at through some sort of biased lens that is causing us to think about things um, in, in a way that they really aren't. Um, and the research can uncover that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it also shows that we care about what's happening in the industry. We care about telling our clients what they need to know, at least for their mm -hmm. information. I think yeah. that's what it shows as well. Yeah. Awesome. And we talked about research insights a lot, internal, external, third party. And now I'm not sure how to measure the impact of research. So one of the terms that I've been hearing a lot about is net promoter score, mm -hmm. NPS. So could you explain to me what it is, what you think of that and where it sits in different metrics that are applied to insights and research? Yeah, I mean, net promoter score is something that's been used for a really long time. Um, it's a metric that evaluates whether or not a audience uh, uh, of, of the research, a respondent of the research, um, would be promoting or supporting a brand. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's one of those metrics that has been used for a really, really long time. However, I mean, I, it, net promoter score has been something that's been, that, that, that's had, you know, some level of controversy on, on its importance over time. You know, I, I always look at it as that, that, you know, NPS, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you something that's really important, which is the why people are promoting or promoting, uh -huh. right? So you may find out that your brand has scored, you know, above or below the average uh, for NPS, but you have no idea what the, what the cause of that perception actually is with NPS. That's why you need to be using other things uh, on top of NPS to kind of get there. Um, 
you know, it needs to, you know, one of the things that it doesn't account for, I mean, or it should account for, but sometimes it doesn't is, you know, demographic segments uh, that respond differently. Um, you know, if a brand is seen, uh, if, if a brand has specifically seen changes in their NPS scores over time, um, the question that, that needs to be asked is, is it because the product or service has changed of that brand? Mm -hmm. Or is it because the customers themselves have changed, right? So that, that's a critical distinction. Um, and you need to understand the difference on, you know, if you're going to leverage NPS as a, as a, uh, a metric. Um, it, can be, it can also be used, I think, effectively um, as a, uh, a benchmarking metric against competitors. Um, however, getting NPS scores from competitors is also challenging. It's not something that's, re that's revealed uh, or, or provided, right? So, you know, how can you, you know, how can you execute upon a strategy if you don't necessarily have the net promoter scores of, of, of your top competitors? Um, and you need to consider how to weight the scores, um, you know, if you do get them for any true comparisons. This often doesn't really get done. Um, and, and sometimes it does, but, you know, you just got to be mindful of it. You know, and, if, uh, and Raj, is it a, it's a percentage, right? So you don't even know what the sample base is for that uh, if yeah. you're looking at competition? Yeah, typically. I mean, I think that it, it depends on how... Uh, open. I mean, some companies give a little more detail around their NPS scores than others, um, but it's something that typically isn't, uh, is held kind of close to the vest. So you got to be mindful of that. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, if you're looking at NPS as a, you know, as, as, as something that's going to be in your repertoire for, for conducting brand research, you also need to be adding things in like brand value, obviously attribute metrics, uh, what the perceived quality is of your brands, um, you know, loyalty scores, advocacy scores. I mean, these are all things that in combination with NPS can provide a very good story, but NPS as itself, just an isolated metric, mm -hmm. only, I think only has so much value to it. You, you really need to be cautious if you're, if you're relying everything on your NPS score, because I think that it doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. Yeah, and, that, I, and that is not something that, that's not profound. I think that any, any marketer, any insights, uh, someone who's in the insight space who does a lot of this type of work would agree upon. Like it's, it's just one of those things that, you know, it's NPS has been around for, like I said, decades, you know, and uh, so it isn't a new metric. Um, and, but I do think that it gives to a certain degree, it does have a disproportionate value. Um, disproportionate think, value. Yeah. And I think that, I think that that's something that, uh, you know, smart marketers, especially if you're dealing with third party research, firms can probably advise on, on, how, on what else you should be, you know, leveraging when you're, when you're, when you're trying to understand what your current state is and, and, and versus your competitors. Yeah, that's awesome because also I feel like net promoter score is, stands for customer advocacy because again, when the budgets are cut, we do need that word of the mouth mm -hmm. and recommendations from existing customers. But again, not necessarily we know that customers do recommend us. So they state they will, right? And that's what we count, mm -hmm. but we do not necessarily know whether that happens. And so basically you need to leverage other metrics and possibly not only from research and insights, but maybe from your operational systems yeah. or, you know, how your sales grow or any other business related, not only yeah. marketing related parameters. Yeah, and, I, and remember, I mean, uh, net promoter score measures intention, right? It doesn't, in, it does, mm -hmm. it doesn't measure behavior. So, you need to ensure that you, you don't forget about understanding what a customer actually has done uh, as it pertains to your brand, um, not merely what they are intending to do. So that's where there is that's a, key. an overlay, that's very important. right? Mm -hmm. There's an overlay mm -hmm. with, with what NPS can track and what it does track. So as long as people are aware of that, and, and, and many marketers are, um, you know, they'll, they'll leverage it as they, as they see fit, but there, it, it needs to be in combination with other things. That's awesome. And then just to wrap up the matrix score, um, the matrix and how they're interpreted actually. So when you work with your clients, mm -hmm. how do you describe, how do you explain what is that you do? Because even from types of research that you, you described here mm -hmm. and types of metrics, it sounds a bit complex to me and I've been doing marketing forever not mm -hmm. maybe so much deep in, in the research and insight space, but it right. sounds very relevant. Can you describe this like internal storytelling, I would say with your customers? Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things that we, um, we mentioned to our customers is, and, and 
research has a tendency to sometimes sound complicated when, you know, essentially what it is, I always say, tell people, you know, if you substitute the word research with discovery, that's, that's an easy way to kind of, you know, say, okay, that's something that I can understand a little bit more, right? Because Mm -hmm. it sounds a little bit less complicated potentially. Um, Essentially what we do is, you know, we're a vehicle to increase the odds of people to make better decisions, right? You said most it of good. Our, said most well. Of our, yeah, well, most of our clients, I mean, they, they spend the bulk of their day trying to make these critical decisions, you know? Yeah. Which brand messages should we go with? Which uh, communication strategy should we go with? You know, what percentage of our audience um, is, is, you know, are real advocates versus those that are not? Um, you know, these are the, and, and, and a million other decisions that need to be made. You know, what we are doing within the research industry is trying to understand how we can help our clients make these decisions better. We, I would never say there's silver bullets in the work we do. There is no such thing as that. Um, but I do think we can help increase the odds of making better decisions. Um, so if you're at a point where you're at a 50-50 of which direction to go in, yeah. if we can get that to be a 60-40 or 70-30 or an 80-20, then that's a huge, huge win for us. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do our best to identify, identify what the variables of influence are. Um, and what percentage formulation those, ver- those variables impact your actual decisions. Um, so if we do that effectively, and, and every project is different, every client is different, every audience is different, uh, which is why it's, it's, it's really, really important to have sort of your consulting hat on as much as you can when you're working through these projects, because there, it, you cannot be formulaic in, your, in the way you approach them, because you know, these brands don't necessarily react the same way. These audiences don't react the same way. And you need to make sure you have a custom approach to every single engagement that you do. Um, and, you know, leveraging both, you know, all of, the, all of the research tools you have to your disposal is going to be critical. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that it, it's, if you can think of it in those parameters and those terms, it really does simplify and, and, and put people at ease that, you know, doing research uh, within, you know, the objective of, of, of influence and engagement um, is, is not complicated, but it needs to be done properly. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the discovery part. This yeah. is the perception, right? How, yeah. how you try to understand those things. And for me, actually, you just opened my eyes. And if I need to take one takeaway uh, from this conversation, it would be if previously I've been thinking about, hey, let's A-B test a message and spend money on advertising and see what resonates. Mm-hmm. It's actually, you know what? You have another option. You can research and see what is that you need to test. And maybe you will spend less money on advertising and your conver- conversion rate in the end of the day will be, yeah. will be higher. So yeah. that's great. You have more yeah. options than Absolutely. you thought you yeah. had. Right. And I, I'm not, I don't want to take away from advertising. I think advertising is, is unbelievably valuable and, and, and uh, you know, ma- massive companies have done quite well uh, leveraging smart advertising. I just look at it as, um, you know, would, if those ads would be more effective if they were telling a better story. Yeah. Right. If you were, so we've done, we've done tons of projects where we have done advertorials where clients mm-hmm. come to us and they have their ad for their product and services within a piece, but above, above the advertisement, we're sharing some custom insights about the issue of, of the day um, uh, and creating some level of thought leadership content that, that ties to the advert, to the advertisement itself. Um, in my opinion, I think that's a more effective way to go. I mean, yes, it may cost a little bit more and it's going to be um, a little more time consuming to do so. But if you are trying to create a differentiation uh, from competitors that are just outspending you and have the ability to outspend you, uh, this is something that you may want to consider. Yeah, awesome. And I think many companies are exactly in that situation when mm-hmm. the competition is out is just spending more and we need to do something different okay i think it was a wonderful conversation a lot of insights for me at least and i'm sure for our audience as well and uh, to wrap this up what do you think each one of us be you a product marketeer a brand manager or any other marketing or not marketing person what is that we can start doing every day Mm -hmm. to maybe start leveraging insights and research better and more in our job and it doesn't matter whether we have budget to outsource that to third party or not yeah i mean it's a good question i think that there's lots of things people can do um i think that it's really um i mean to start off with i think it's an it's it's an 
attitude that of, of curiosity. Mindset. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a mindset that you, you need to be going into uh, trying to better understand what's going on with your brand, what's going on with your industry. Um, you know, I convey this message to everyone within our, our organizations from uh, the salespeople um, to operations and, 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 and all the way across. I, it, it's very critical to be curious. Um, you know, read as much as you can about what's going on in your industry, what's going on with your, your brand. Try to do your best to uncover what you know and identify the gaps of what you don't know. And the more, you, the more often you do that, the more um, opportunities you will uncover to do the research and the homework, if you will, that's necessary to drive your brand forward. Uh, drive your products and services to the right people with the right message um, and, and through, you know, through the right vehicles. Um, and I think that, um, I think that it's, it's, it's critical to be curious. It's critical that you, your, your questions are informed um, mm -hmm. and that you're, you're, you're leveraging not just your internal resources, but external resources to, to maximize uh, the impact of what you can do. Um, I think that's, that's, if I had to say that's, you know, organizations that I, and clients that I've dealt with that ask lots of questions um, that, and, and, and say we, and, and provide a strong understanding of what they don't know. Um, I think are the, those, those engagements are usually the most successful. Uh, challenging engagements are ones where people think they know everything and they're yeah. kind of just going through the motions and you get a sense that regardless of what I tell them from what we're finding, they're going to do what they're going to do anyway. Yeah, right. and that's not only for research, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. across the fold. Right, right, exactly. And that's why that's why I always say that, you know, curiosity is I think critical. Um, and you know, if if you start off being curious or if you do make take steps in trying to understand your these markets a little bit better, your market's a little bit better and your business a little bit better, and also identifying stakeholders. I mean, like I said, I always say I always say, you know, when we do these studies, it's not just identifying the needs and challenges of your customer, but your customer's customer. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and and if you can do that well uh, and effectively, you get a far better understanding of what's going on around you and how to impact it. Well, basically, that will help your customers to drive better of results course. because yeah, they're selling course. to their end customers. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Raj. Um, thank you for coming again. No, thank you. Insights. And we'll summarize that. And I think we'll have a great guide how to. Stay curious and then you'll find your first chance to leverage that research. Start small. Prove it works and mm -hmm. then grow bigger. Thank you so much again. Thanks, Kira.